but to share a bit about the pathway, kind of the journey to appointment on a state sector board, and also share some of the nominations database information. So this is me. You could go to the next slide, Marina. Mm -hmm. So the 2019 stock take, as Marina mentioned, this is the first time that we did this stock take in collaboration with the Office for Ethnic Communities. And the first time we were able to look at representation for Maori and ethnic diversity on state sector boards. We looked at 433 state sector boards uh, that had 2,618 board members who are appointed through the Cabinet Appointments and Honors Committee. So that's really important. What we look at is members who are appointed by APH, the Cabinet Appointments and Honors Committee. You could go to the next slide, Marina. Be great. Great. So this quote here is from uh, Minister Salisa, who opened the 2019 stock take, and it's really around why diversity on boards matters. Diverse boards make better decisions. When we embrace the strength of our diverse society, we gain a broader range of knowledge, skills, and perspectives. We bring in the expertise and diverse views of our ethnic communities to contribute and provide advice and possible, possible solutions, which is helpful for our overall well being. So I think our goal as a collective uh, in the state sector and as nominating agencies is we want to see state sector boards that represent New Zealand, that represent all of Aotearoa's communities. If you could go to the next point, Marina. So this is what we found through the, the data that we gathered. Um, we got ethnicity data from 94.7% of board members. We found that just over 70% were European, uh, over 20% are Maori, 4.6% Pacific peoples, 3.6% Asian, and then 0.6% Middle Eastern, Latin American, or African. You go next one, Marina. But what we found is that appointments in 2019 were increasingly diverse. So the appointments that were made last year were more diverse than the makeup of the boards have been previously, if that makes sense. So we're seeing a focus on having increasingly diverse board members, which is really encouraging. You can see the numbers there are an increase from current ethnicity, so a higher increase from Maori, Pacific, Asian, and Middle Eastern, Latin American as well. So this is really important, I think, because we can see that there is a focus on this diversity in appointments. Great, go to the next slide. So which state sector boards are we talking about and why do they matter? So as I mentioned, there's over 430 state sector boards that we look at. They govern New Zealand's most important uh, kind of our organizations, our district health boards, education. And you can see, like Marina said, there's Treasury that has really important organizations. We have the state-owned enterprises. Um, we have things like Kiwi Rail, Met Service. You could take a look at this list. This is all on the Public Service Commission's website, so you can find all of this information there. But you can see that these organizations, the boards that govern these, help lead our society. So it's critical that they reflect our society and that we have board members who are skilled but also diverse in the way that they think, um, that they're able to lead us into the future, that they can adapt. We've really seen the importance of this with COVID-19 as well, how critical it is that our boards can adapt and pivot um, and that they can meet the challenges that our countries, that our country faces. So that's kind of, yeah, that's an interesting list I think to look at. Um, thanks, Marina. So what I wanted to show you here is that while we, have done well in some areas of ethnic diversity and um, representation for Maori across state sector boards as a whole it looks quite good at about 21 percent. When you actually dig into the ministerial portfolios you can see that there are some areas where there are a number of gaps. So these what these on the left highlight is the board portfolios, the ministerial portfolios, the number of appointees on each of those boards, and then that's the amount of ethnicity data we gathered. And then you can see across the row where there are gaps. Um, this isn't all of them, they're all available on our website. I just wanted to kind of highlight some of these to show some where we're doing really well in terms of diversity, like education. If you were to look at education, 
we have over 29% Maori, 8% Pacific, um, lower representation for Asian communities, but you can see that education does have quite a bit of diversity. Um, when we look at a portfolio like transport, we can see that there's a really long way to go there. So it's currently sitting at 97% European on those boards. Um, I thought workplace relations and safety was one that was quite, um, could use some improvement as well. There's 26 board members there and it is 96% European. So I think one of the things we've talked about as a sector is that having this data now, we previously didn't have it, but now that we do, it can help us see where we need to improve, where the kind of spaces, areas for development are. And we do have a long way to go, but now that we have this information, at least we know where we're starting from. Please go to the next point, Marina. And so this little graph down here at the bottom is a kind of a success story that I just wanted to share. In 2018, the government set a target of 50% representation for women on state sector boards. And Minister Genter announced last week that we have met that target. So that is really exciting. Um, and you can see how progress has tracked over time towards achieving that 50%. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to talk about is if you're thinking about your governance career in state sector boards, where is it that you would get started? Uh, and I really love this quote from Karen Rungi, who's a state sector board member and deputy chair of the Arts Council, where she says, um, this is in a recent interview that she did, she would like to see some of the age old myths attached to what board members look like debunked. It's not just an end of life occupation. You don't have to wait until you've had a glittering corporate career and it's not just a group of people sitting around and chatting. I think this is really telling. Um, you don't have to wait till the end of your career to look at governance. But I love this, this image of the COFI. Governance is something that you have to nourish and develop. Uh, if you're thinking about moving into the governance space, it requires training, um, investment, you need to think about. And I think also having a really clear understanding for yourself around why state sector governance. What is it that interests you in the state sector? Why is this an area that you're interested in moving into and also why governance? Because governance is different from management. Many of you will know that who are on not-for-profit boards or other private sector boards, but why is it that you're interested in moving into the governance space? And I think it's also about knowing yourself. Um, what is your kind of brand or value proposition? What is it that you as an individual would bring to a board and being really clear about that and how that fits with the board positions that you're applying for. Thanks, Marina. So this slide is one that the Ministry for Women, Judy and my team developed. It shows the journey to appointment on a state sector board and the role that nominating agencies can play in this journey. So if you start on the left side, you can see that you as a candidate may be interested in a board role, state sector board role, and then you may register with a nomination service. So at the end of my slides, I've got uh, contact information for the nomination service. But once you register with them, then your name is in a database of people interested in state sector board roles. You would want to go on, uh, like I previously mentioned, and continue to develop your, your skills, your kind of experience, um, thinking about developing your governance CV. I think Craig is gonna talk about that after me, but that's really important to have a strong governance CV. Um, so once you kind of go down this pathway, you may be shortlisted by the nominating service for a board role that we've been asked to put people forward to. Um, and then we would send your name to the appointing agency or ask you to apply directly. And then if you're shortlisted by them, and you can be nominated and the minister, the relevant minister would select their preferred candidate and they would put forward that name to the appointments and honors committee. And then there you can see the appointment completed. So it's a really long journey. Um, these aren't something that happen quickly. There's a lot of touch points and a lot of work goes into an appointment, kind of that end outcome of the appointment. Thanks, Marina. So lastly, I wanted to show <laughs> <laughs> like they <were> drawn on. <laughs> I wanted to show the um, the appointing nominating agencies uh, different contact information. So there's ourselves, Ministry for Women. You can always nominate us. 
we have a website, there's Office of Ethnic Communities, Joe's here at the webinar right now, um, they have a database, there's Ministry for Pacific Peoples and Kalitis here as well, so you can contact them. Uh, Te Puni Kokori also has a database, they are in the process of developing their database to kind of engage in some improvements, so they should have an excellent high functioning database soon. And then Office for Disability Issues also has a database and Jacinda is here. So those are kind of relevant databases. I really encourage you, if one of these fits um, with part of your identity, if you're a woman, um, member of an ethnic community, I really recommend you sign up for, and yeah, I'm happy to share all of these slides. And I can also provide you with links. I'll provide Marina with the links to where the stock take is on our website but I really encourage you to sign up for a database. It can increase your chances of getting that much closer to a state sector board role. So I think that's it from me. Sorry, I talked a lot and quite quickly, um, but happy to answer any questions and Marina can share, can definitely share all these slides with you after. I was wanting to ask um, one question on behalf of somebody who had sent it through to me. Um, how long does the appointment process actually take, um, Kelsey? That might be a better question for Craig or Murray or Ayana. Um, they'll be able to speak to that more. But I, from my experience, I think it would also depend on the board and what's involved in that process. Um, once you're registered with our database, Depending on your level of experience, um, it could take a while for you to be put forward for a board role, but it really depends on what openings there are. Uh, do you want to speak, Craig, to that? I'm just emphasizing the point you've already touched on. It is horses for courses. So uh, a fast, quick moving appointment process might be two months from, from go to woe. Uh, other more complicated ones, which have a lot of consultation and checking required, might be six months. So. Um, that's in addition to any time you might have been waiting uh, at a nomination agency in, in the database. Uh, patience is really the word to keep in mind around this. Great. Thanks very much, Kelsey. Um, and thanks very much, Craig. Um, well, we um, will move along to um, uh, the next speaker, who is Hugh Lawrence um, from the Public Service Commission. Um, take it away, Hugh. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, Kōti Lawrence Tane. Um, I'm not going to have any slides. Uh, I couldn't compete with Kelsey's in any case. Extremely colourful and incredibly informative. But I've got something slightly more mundane to talk about, which is what do you need to know about having been appointed? It's one thing to go through the process of being appointed. Once you've arrived on the, the state sector board, there's quite a lot you need to know about. And... Um, departments that are supporting ministers to make the appointment will often run induction programs as, as do the entities and I'm just going to signpost to you some of the things you might like to know about uh, it won't be everything because normally in an induction program of this kind we spend a whole day on the topic I've got 10 minutes so uh, we'll be compressing some information but to give you a taste of what you might need to know about and I'll, I'll speak a little about some of the differences between um, governance in the state sector and governance in the, uh, the non-government sector, whether it's the private sector or the, um, or the social economy. So this isn't the final word. There's quite a lot of interrelationship between the points I'm going to make. I'm going to talk in particular about two things which we find a lot of incoming board members have a difficulty with. The first is the idea that the Crown has an ownership interest in the organisation. So we're talking primarily, about, as was Kelsey, about statutory entities. And although advisory panels are not statutory entities, much of what I'm going to talk about has applicability. So the Crown's ownership interest is something that incoming board members often have very little insight to and have trouble getting to grips with it. Put simply, um, you're appointed to a state board, a state sector board, at the pleasure of the minister. And the way that you're appointed and the way your terms of appointment are ended are, again, at the pleasure of the minister. And quite bluntly, most of the time, no explanations are required and no explanations are expected. So that's a slightly confrontational perspective to provide. 
but it helps to set the, set the scene for understanding some important principles of being on a state sector board. And the first is that you are owned as an organization by the, by the crown. Um, they're called crown companies and crown entities because they're owned by the crown. And that's a new phenomenon for a lot of private sector directors who come onto the board having been the owners, having been the most experienced uh, directors of private sector companies, may have been uh, directors of maybe 10, 15, or even more uh, public sector companies, many of them high profile, acting as the owner. They arrive on the Crown Sector Board and find that they're not the owner. That takes a different, gives you a very different perspective on what you do as a board member. The second thing, and linked to that, is that the Crown also has another interest, and that's a purchase interest. In other words, what's the, what, what's the, what's the government, what's the minister getting for the money? Funding's allocated in the budget for a particular purpose, technical term and appropriation. And that purpose has got to be uppermost in the board's mind when it sets out its strategic thinking its, and making decisions about fun, how funding will be allocated. Now, the entity's functions and terms of operational decision-making will be laid out either in establishment legislation or in terms of reference if you're on an advisory panel. For Crown entities in particular, the Crown Entities Act lays out the rules of the road for the owner-board relationship. And there's an accountability framework built into the Act called Statements of Intent and statements of performance expectation, and of course, the annual report. So those two items are, are the first things that incoming directors have to get to grips with, because then you find that having come onto the board, although you've got some very good experience on being a board member, you may have a good insight to what good governance looks like on the organization that you've been involved with, or organizations plural, all of a sudden you find that the things that you thought you understood take on a different perspective. And I'm just going to lay some of them out right now. I was going to share a screen at this point to show you the table, but unfortunately the share screen function isn't working for my end. It doesn't really matter because I'm only going to lay out a few of them and to give you a sense of what's different. So if you're in the private sector or the non-government sector, setting the strategic direction, is, the, is one of the primary roles that you'd have as a board member. You do the strategic thinking, you lay things out as a board, this is the strategy, and you, off you go, you give it to your management team or your chief executive or general manager, uh, and they implement that work. In, in the state sector, and in particular Crown Entities, you've got a requirement to publish a statement of intent, and not only to publish it um, in paper, it's got to be online. And, it's pub and it has to be a four-year horizon. And it's refreshed every three years. So immediately, you've got new, set, new, new uh, terms of reference around your strategic thinking. This is not taking into account the fact that the government operates on a three-year franchise. And incoming ministers may change what, you, what, what ministers prioritize on the way, which may set you set you back and having to set a new, a new statement of intent. So there's, there's one difference. Strategic risk management. Most good boards have a risk framework, have a risk register, and they'll have the heat map um, to, to see how they're assessing and managing their risks. But the risk geography in the state sector is quite different. For example, most most private sector directors or NGO directors don't have to think about the role of parliament and scrutiny of the opposition. And small missteps might have significant consequences for a minister uh, because the minister is the owner. And so you, you have to come into working in the state sector with a very different understanding of what risk actually means. It's not simply the contingent risk or inherent risk of your organization by the very nature of its business, but there are operational risks, there are political risks, and there are strategic risks that you need to have a good sense of, not simply within the organization that you're on the board of. Then we 
most of us as board members at some stage talk about stakeholder relationships. Well, the minister is your primary stakeholder. But what's the point of you being on a board? The point of being on the board is to drive organizational performance. And what's organizational performance about in the state sector is services and outcomes for New Zealand and for New Zealanders. That means there is a constituency out there that you're serving. And that constituency is one of the important stakeholders and having a relation, an understanding and a relationship with that sector is, is critically important if you're going to be focused on outcomes for New Zealand and New Zealanders and the quality of services. As a board, all of you, I'm sure, understand the idea of the board is the first monitor of performance. In fact, if you're in the private sector or the non-government sector, you're the only monitor of performance. Um, but you come into a Crown Entity Board and you suddenly find there's this thing called a monitor. Now, most of you went to school, had milk monitors and things like that, but this is not the same as a milk monitor. This is about the monitor of your performance as a board. And it's laid out in the Crown Entities Act. And you have to have a high trust, meaningful engagement with the monitor because the monitor is acting as the agent of the minister. So monitoring departments are the minister's agent. In a technical sense, they are the eyes and ears of the minister. And they should, uh, done well, be, operate, be speaking with the minister's voice. The collective duties of the board are, again, things that people in the private sector have a good feel for. The Companies Act lays those things out. And if you're a private sector director, you'll have a good sense of what the collective duties of the board are. But in the, in the states, in the crown sector, and the crown entity, and if you, if you have your copy of the Crown Entities Act open, as, as you probably don't, um, sections 49 to 52 lay out this whole question of who you owe your collective duties to. They're owed to the minister. And therefore, you must actually think about what is in the legislation uh, rather than what your broad understanding of collective duties might be. Appointing a chief executive. Well, that's probably the most important job that any organization does, uh, any, any board undertakes. And in the private sector and in the non-government sector, you will certainly be used to employment and advertising and negotiating uh, the terms and conditions of employment. If you're on a crown entity board, you must not agree to terms and conditions without the consent of the commissioner. Now, that's something that becomes quite problematic for some boards which have a sense of the market that they think they're serving. And therefore, the, the scope and scale of the uh, remuneration that might be required. So you suddenly find yourself as a board member having to engage with, this, with the Public Service Commission on terms and conditions of employment, which require the commissioner's consent before you can actually finalize the individual, the individual employment agreement. That is very new for a lot of chairs and can be very challenging. Account accountability to stakeholders. Well, most of us are used to that idea that stakeholders were accountable to them. Members or shareholders, if you're in the private, in the, uh, private sector company. Accountability in the, crown, in the crown entity land, quite different. Parliament is the highest court in the land. Um, you're accountable to that, to that parliament. And to give you, there are many war stories of boards failing to understand that. You may have, you will have to, as a Crown Entities Board Chair, explain your goals and your performances to select committees. You'll have to go and sit alongside the minister and, and be subject to the interrogation of the, um, of, of the select committee and the opposition. And many board members and board chairs find this is a very new experience and somewhat unnerving the first time you do it. I had one board chair, incoming board chair earlier this year, had been in the position of the chair for one week and found herself sitting alongside the minister in the select committee. That was a trial by fire. You'll have to answer parliamentary questions. You'll have to respond to information requests from the minister. You'll have to respond to information requests from the monitoring department. These are things that you would not normally have experienced. 
So that's just a taste of some of the things that are different once you become onto a, a, a board in the crown sector. And advisory panels are not a lot different, except that oftentimes the chief executive is appointing your, uh, you, you as a member, but not always, can be a minister as well. So I'll leave it there, Marina. If there are any questions, I don't think I've gone over my 10 minutes, have I? And, no. uh, oh, thank you very much, Hugh. Um, uh, and you um, have gone to time perfectly. Um, I had a question for you. Um, uh, does the um, Public Service Commission um, and or any other government department provide, once we've actually gotten through the hoops and have yep. gone through the appointment process and we're actually appointed to a board, a state sector board, is there any induction or any training for um, a, a new board member? Yes, there's two, two parts. The answer comes in two parts. First, the monitoring department itself should be providing some level of induction. And, and that's mixed across government. Some do it in one way, others do it in another way. Nevertheless, that, that will be done. And Murray might like to talk a little about the Treasury induction, which is uh, comp comprehensive. But if you, if you just want to know more about the Crown Entity system and all the things that uh, there's expectations, if you come to the to Kawamata Hall Public, Sector, Public Service Commission website, and you look under the tile that says our work, you'll see, you'll click on that and it'll say Crown Entity Guidance. And the Crown Entity Guidance provides you a chapter and verse on all things Crown Entity. Um, it will give you insights to how the system works, what examples of good practice might be, and also there's a, a very good guide to incoming chairs on developing a governance manual, um, as well as uh, some induction slides on the, the kind of things that I've been talking about. So go to the public service. Oh, thank you. Somebody's put it up. <laughs> thank you, Marina. <laughs> uh, and look under Crown Entities, and there's a wealth of information there. And then, of course, if you really need to know something, you just give us a call. <laughs> Unless there are any, oh, no, there's a question here. Um, are there instances when governance members are removed um, once they are on um, a board? Um, and uh, how is their individual performance assessed once they are on the board? Uh, well, okay, again, uh, I'll take the first part. Uh, the, the, you serve at the minister's pleasure. The minister can terminate your appointment when, uh, at any time. I mean, obviously, it doesn't happen very often. but. Uh, in the case of where a board might be either under a relationship between the board chair or the board as a whole and the minister has broken down, the minister can, of course, press the nuclear button and replace the board um, straight away. And, and there are some examples of that. Uh, there are two di district health boards that currently have commissioners where the minister has done exactly that. Um, and sometimes your term of appointment after three years you might have an expectation of being reappointed, suddenly find that you're not reappointed. So that's part of that. The second, quest, uh, the, the second part of your question, which has completely gone out of my head. Um, About a, a assessment of performance. Assessment. Of right, so boards are expected to do some form of self-evaluation. Again, it's mixed. Some chairs are heavily invested in it, others less so. And one of the jobs of a monitoring department is to sit alongside the chair and give them support on things like self-assessment, self-evaluation. It's completely up to the board on how it does it. The mm. board has that level of autonomy. There's no prescription for that. Great. Thank you for that. And just one final question. Um, uh, you'd mentioned political party process. Um, do you have to be a left, right, green? <laughs> or somewhere in the, the, the middle um, to be appointed to a state sector board? Right. So uh, this is going to be a, a, a classical kind of obtuse <laughs> answer. Uh, first and foremost, as I said at the beginning, you serve at the pleasure of the minister. It is the minister who makes the appointment. It is by definition a political appointment. That said, 
ministers have an interest in the organisations operating well. And one of the jobs of monitoring departments is to be able to get good information about potential candidates that go to their skills, knowledge and experience that make them strong candidates for appointment. If, however, you are determined to put your political colours on your sleeve and wear them at all times, that, that may fight, leave you with a challenging situation of the relationship with the minister. So there are some candidates, some chairs, uh, for example, um, Sir Michael Cullen uh, was appointed, a uh, former Labour Minister of Finance, was appointed by a national-led government to a significant appointment position. And so the, the answer is in two parts. <laughs> One, <laughs> it's a political decision by definition, but second, it's about making sure that the quality of information that we've got about candidates emphasises skills, knowledge and experience and competencies mm. to be great governors. Great. Well, thank you very much for that um, wealth of knowledge coming through, Hugh. Um, thank you very much. Well, I'll now um, move along to another great source of uh, knowledge, um, Murray Costello from the Treasury. Got a Koto. Uh, now, I am going to try and share a screen. So it's, it's sitting up on the screen in front of me. I hope it's going to come up. Okay, let's see. Is this going to work? It says I'm screen sharing, but I can't see what. Okay, does it say Crown Board appointments 23 September? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it must be working. It's weird. It's showing on one screen and, and not on another one. Um, which makes it interesting for me to try and click from one screen through to another picture. Uh, this is okay. Now, do you have a picture with circles on it? Not yet. This is oh. okay. Um, I'm going to abandon the screen sharing uh, because I can't see a way to um, for me to step through the slides. That's okay. Uh, there's. Yeah. I just have one suggestion. If you use Alt Tab, you can bring different windows to the front, so that could work, but it might not. I'll try this here. Share this. Yeah. So if you yeah. Alt Alt-Tab, it should rotate the things that are at the front of your screen, so that could help. Don't know if it will. But Crown Board Appointment. Uh, yeah, and it's not, it's not, uh, sorry, total fail there. Okay, uh, anyway, I will, oh, Marina, hang on. Perhaps I can help. Oh, uh, yep, I'm handing it over to Marina. Are you able to? Yes. Oh, okay. Right. Now, this has already come up because I was focusing, you know, given their limited amount of time, um, I really wanted to focus on advice that, that people can, you know, kind of use immediately. And this came up in <laughs> Kelsey's slide, as you would have seen there, multiple ministers appointing to multiple agencies. And the Treasury is, despite um, Tracy's nice words that, that you know, um, where was it high influence <laughs> we have the biggest number of appointers although it's true that the treasury does have um, some of the very large boards in the crown sector we have 12 SOEs but m we have more crown entities that we're appointing to 29 I think is the, is the latest count plus a number of other agencies dotted around in there and my key point in putting this up for you is that if we are interested in something, um, we are, whether it's transport, justice, you know, environment, uh, culture and heritage, you're going to have to do some homework to, uh, you know, sort out who is appointing to these agencies. Now, the list of them was on Kelsey's slide, but I'd also give Marina a slide that um, sets out which department has a whole lot of key agencies as well. So that will hopefully help. 
in the treasury board uh, area. So we've got 43 boards and we're looking at a, around a third of those positions each year and, and some 50 new appointments. And next might be, oh yes, a colourful slide showing that's the range of things that the Treasury itself deals with. You'll recognise lots of familiar ones in there, uh, but some of them, like Air New Zealand and the energy companies, uh, because they are listed stock exchange companies actually do their own, you know, very much their own board appointments. Um, but that's the range of things that, that we've got here at the Treasury. And next is... Okay, the board appointments database. Now, some of you I know will be on this um, because I recognise some names <laughs> in the list of attendees. And... I put this up because to give you a, a sense of the scale, and it's the interesting bullet point is the second one. There are some 1,500 people who have got chief executive experience, um, not necessarily at you know, major companies. It could be at all sorts of range of organisations, but you know, competition is fierce for board roles. And the next bullet point, you know, that, that's a lot more than you generally get applying for a job. Um, and it just goes to show the, the scale of interest in the board roles that I've seen across MB and at the Treasury. Now, the Treasury's database is not one database that gives you access to all the Crown vacancies. It only has these four. Um, but if you're on the Treasury database, you will get emails saying these are the vacancies that are coming up at, from these four different departments you know, where we're managing those appointments. Um, what have I got next? Okay, a database entry. Uh, this is a dummy one, as you can tell from the name, <laughs> Miss Paula Tester. Uh, but any database is only as good as the information that gets put into it. And you can see on the, at the top right side there that the age of this uh, fake candidate is zero. That's not hugely helpful. At least they have put a gender and an ethnicity in there. But in the middle, so towards the bottom third, you can see a CEO role and a manager role. These come up under the heading of Crown Governance roles, which they clearly aren't. So if you're going to enter onto the database, please um, take some care to um, enter your experience, you know, as accurately as you can. It, it's a clunky database, but it's the only one we have at the moment. Um, but yeah, please take care to enter your experience. Um, you can also attach a CV. The attraction of the Treasury database is that you can keep that updated, um, you know, as, as your experience changes and um, up, upload a, a fresh CV. And what else do I have, Marina? Okay, yes, getting on the long list. Now, we put this in because you know, there's multiple ways. And I, looking through the questions that people had submitted through to Marina before this, you know, you know how, how can people put their best foot forward? What skills are being sought? How do, you know, how do you get onto these boards? And Craig is going to talk about the, your CV and your cover letter. And that's such a critical thing. I, I can't stress that enough, but I'm going to leave him to you know, cover the content on that. I wanted to pick up um, a couple of other things. A lot of this is, um, Hugh talked about the differences with the, to the Crown environment and the private sector environment, but a lot of advice would be common to the private sector too, because the things that um, I've jotted down here after you know, talking to my team, key thing, build your governance experience. And it doesn't really matter what kind of board, because what every department is looking for in terms of finding good candidates for ministers is some governance experience and how people have dealt with challenges as a board member. Um, okay, that's tough if you haven't got board experience, but you know, there are, you know, you've got to try and build something up there. It just makes it any candidate a tougher sell to a chair um, and ultimately to their board colleagues um, if they don't have great experience to bring to the board. Um, 
uh, that doesn't mean that it has to be at the end of your career, as was mentioned earlier. Um, but it's you know you you want to be adding value to both the board's discussions and um, to the management. Another thing is to target the boards that interest you, and that's where you have to do that hunting around the departments. Um, a key thing is that the government has a tendency to replace like with like. So if you say if you're interested in a board, you look up the board who's sort of ending two terms. That doesn't mean that necessarily ending their time on the board, but the chances are higher that they are ending their term on the board. Um, is your would you be a good you know replacement candidate? Um, because you know again, chances are that the board wants to maintain something like that. It just gives you something to aim at um, and you know, do a bit of homework and find out who's leaving. The other thing is work your networks. You know, try to meet your, you know, the target chairs or be introduced by people that you know um, because you know, chairs and boards provide nominations. They're there at the bottom right, you know, the chair, um, because we do talk to the boards about what skills they're looking for and who they think might be you know, good to add into the into the list. Um, in the crowd, the difference to the crown environment that also means talking to ministers and MPs because ministers ask their colleagues and their coalition partners for suggestions for boards as well. Um, so once you're on the list, then it's a case of you know your material and your experience um, showing through. A couple of things about the database. And I think this would be true on any of the databases that other agencies would have as well. Um, try to avoid applying for anything going because that you know database carries data and it will show, uh, at the Treasury one certainly shows every board you put your hand up for. That's fine. It certainly shows that people are very persistent <laughs> and interested. Um, but it can, there's a risk there that you know, it looks a bit unfocused that people are just applying for anything going, you know, just trying to get on any board and they're not being, you know, particularly focused on where their skill set um, might add great value. But in talking about that, I wouldn't just because you haven't made it through an appointment round doesn't mean you should withdraw. Um, because, you know, I can easily point to examples where somebody didn't make it through one appointment round, but made it through the next one because, you know, the board vacancies change, what the skill set sort being changed, and um, they, you know, they came up the very next year as a great candidate. A couple of things that were mentioned either in um, uh, our catch up yesterday, uh, one is the, the or, or have come up this morning, um, future director scheme. And I see that Carol Cheng is uh, out there in the audience today, um, future director at the Financial Markets Authority. And this is a great scheme where, again, if you've got board contacts, um, the Institute of Directors is certainly willing to help people get around a board table as a board intern, as a future director, um, you know, a, a foot in the door to some of these other boards. Um, question came up from Marina about people sending in their CVs. Um, there's no wrong door for that. You could send them to a minister's office um, and they will, you know, you can guarantee they will send them on to the relevant department. Uh, I think that's my key points to raise. So any questions? Uh, no, I don't uh, think so, okay. but um, thank you very much, um, Murray. Um, uh, one of the other things is that um, Super Diversity Institute, oh, there's Carol waving, and I know that Sue <laughs> Hoy is also waving because she's a future director yeah. on the Lion Foundation. But right. yes, uh, one of the things is that the Super Diversity Institute will be having a post-election session in Auckland only, I'm afraid, um, with the Institute of Directors to talk more about future directors, but also uh, mentoring for diversity with um, uh, super diverse women and um, New Zealand Asian leaders slash New Zealand Asian lawyers. And um, one of our speakers, um, Jerry He, is um, uh, in the mentoring for diversity program this year. 
Um, thank you very much, Murray. That was very informative. Um, now we will um, go on to one of the near final um, public sector um, speakers today um, with Craig Priest talking about what to put in your CV and covering these mm. Thank you, Murray. Thank you. Uh, kia ora, everyone. Now I'm going to put all the pressure on Marina to um, bring up the slides. So good luck on that, Marina. Yes. And um, hopefully I can cast some light on some practical tips on CV and cover letters. Apologies for the lighting in here. Doesn't look like I'm going to cast any light on anything. <laughs> um, what I've got to say does follow quite closely on from what Murray's um, already signalled in terms of um, general themes around improving your chances uh, for appointment, uh, in particular around doing your research and, and not applying for everything. So they are points I'm going to pick up. Um, I work at DIA, Internal Affairs, and uh, in some sense we've got our own little bubble, like the bubble that Murray had at the start of, of his presentation. Uh, we're responsible for about 300 appointments across 50 bodies, um, averaging about 75 per year. The bulk of those appointments are to community-based organisations of community trusts and lottery distribution committees, uh, but we do also have two Crown entities, and uh, we're on track for getting a third, the new water regulator, Tomata Arawai. So in thinking about governance pathways, um, the bodies that we support the appointments to is quite a good starting point because there's a range of options in terms of level of responsibility as an appointee. Uh, about me, uh, I often say my manga is Taita Hill. I'm a proud lower hut person, born and bred. Um, my river is uh, Te Awakarangi, the Hutt River and I'm Pākehā, and I certainly uh, consider myself increasingly Swiss. My wife's Swiss, so I'll start calling myself Ngāti Helvici as well. Um, in terms of the first statement I was wanting to emphasise is um, this is all about ultimately standing out from the crowd. As Murray's already uh, highlighted, um, getting appointed is a competitive process. There's, there's no way of denying that, and um, it's about putting your best foot forward. In terms of the material you're providing in a CV and cover letter, what that is about is really demonstrating that you understand the role and you understand what you have to offer. So it's very much like a job application. Make sure you understand your individual value proposition. That comes down to making a clear case, as this slide's just touching on, and in particular, having a very clear cover letter. Um, as Murray's um, also referenced, um, it's a numbers game. For many roles, there's multiple appointments and actually doing anything you can to establish the case for appointing you is vital. And a cover letter is what the people who are doing the first lift are probably gonna focus on most. Your CV is really the backup detail for the case you make in your cover letter. Both explaining about why you are the right candidate and how you will do the job. And why I put that comment in is it's really about people who are early in their governance, public sector governance career, explaining um, what they can contribute, but also demonstrating they understand what they need to learn on the role or areas for strengthening on the role, um, why they're a good candidate, and also how it fits with your career goals. And that um, is about getting that, making that case for you as an individual, explaining why the role you're applying for fits in with your goals. Marina, if we can go to the next slide. Moving on to the how to, it is about being confident and direct. Um, and a very simple illustration of that is um, generally take a first person tone in your letters. You are presenting the case, you're presenting yourself. Um, be very logical and clear in the layout. Once again, for officials, um, what that will often mean is if you set your cover letter out to reflect the core competencies and skill requirements for the role, that will be the first check they're doing. Has someone offered up information in regard to each of the competencies? And can you make an initial assessment of whether they look like a match, a close match or a very good match? So follow that structure. It's also important to explain why being a diverse candidate matters. What are the insights and the skills that you offer that a candidate who's not offering diversity 
won't have to the same extent. So just um, saying you're a diverse candidate in terms of identifying yourself as such is the very first step. You really need to explain the difference that makes for you as a candidate. And it's finding a balance. You are an individual applying, so you've really got to present yourself as yourself um, try to avoid representing you, uh, yourself as a representative of the community you might come from. That time's not always helpful in grabbing attention first up in a big pile of applicants. Just moving on to the next slide. It's about engaging in the process too. Um, Murray's touched on this as well. Just, just expecting the nominate, being on the nomination database to deliver the, the, the outcome you want is very much a small part of the overall effort of applying. Really, in gut, you know, uh, as Mary said, don't apply for everything, identify those roles which you're the best fit for and really engage as deeply as you can in the process around your application. And that often means asking questions. It also means researching the role. Uh, and as Murray has said, if, the more you can understand about the current membership of the body you're looking at, it gives you the more information to know how to pitch your application and to really understand how good you are as a fit for the role. So finding out about current membership in terms of offices is, is important. There's a lot of information online in that regard, but also don't hesitate to contact the officials that are running the nomination process. The worst people can do is say, they haven't really got time to chat, but if you've done your homework and still have questions, the officials are there to ask questions. So it's about taking ownership. This is my selfish slide. It's about making it easy for officials. This does matter. Um, simple things can make quite a difference. So fill out the forms electronically. Don't use handwriting. In a couple of minutes, someone on a, a hundred application poll trying to read your name when it's not written down, <laughs> it's not, not the best. Um, and always include your full legal name. It's just part and parcel of the process. Um, officials will tend to cut and copy a lot of material from application material. So the, make an effort to just keep the formatting the same as the forms you've got to fill in because that means officials can just cut and paste and grab stuff without having to spend time to rework anything. That, that'll put everyone in a good frame of mind. A couple of other small things, um, always put the most recent events, uh, most information about roles in particular first. So current knowledge should be what's given the emphasis in both cover letters and in CVs. And for qualifications, it's surprising how many applications come in without the institutional year, the qualification was gained, stated, so that always has to be included. Can I just uh, raise, your point yeah. is a great one there, Craig, about cutting and pasting, and could I put it out to everyone, please send a Word version of your CV, that is incredibly useful. The PDF just makes it that bit harder when you get close to appointment. Absolutely. We live in similar worlds, that's for sure. How are we going for time, Marina? Um, you've got about four more minutes. Okay. So as I've said, really the CV, in my view, is there to provide the backup detail. Your pitch, presenting your case, mostly comes down to the cover letter because that's what will get looked at first and considered um, first. In terms of the CV, online templates are fine if they're just tidy and professional. There's no right, wrong template for a CV. Um, but doing everything you can to customise your CV to the particular application, that's where the value comes. So it's often a good idea to put your key skills and experience that are relevant for the role right at the top of your CV so that it reflects what you've got in your cover letter. Um, as I said, information about most recent roles first, less information about older roles. CVs don't have to be in strict chronological order. Typically they are, and that's what people are used to seeing. But if you can see arranging your CV around some themes, around some skills, is actually a clearer way of presenting your, what's relevant in your background to the role, you can consider doing it. It takes a bit more time, it looks a little unusual, but it can make you stand out from the crowd if it's done really well. 
lastly, just, if we just go ahead one more slide, please, Marina. It's also about not overlooking experiences that are actually relevant, especially for early governance roles. So sometimes the experience you have in, through voluntary work or community groups, there are generic learnings and generic skills and experience you've built up there that you can refer to in an application. Um, so in many of the bodies we're appointing to, the core skills are an understanding of community groups, networks, financial management, governance skills and management skills. And I've included in that slide some um, sort of start of a 10 ways of thinking about how to bring in that experience in terms of the words you can use in the cover letter and what to emphasize. Um, it's actually possible for some of those um, more entry type roles to overlook relevant skills and experience. Being on a school board of trustees, for example, or for an NGO voluntary group, if you've been a treasurer, you can talk about the financial skills and management skills you might have build up, built up uh, with that sort of experience. So um, there's time, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, one question that I had, um, Craig, was you said that you, we um, uh, should uh, include um, comments about our own individual successes rather than being a representative from a community or, um, and I, I just feel that um, for a lot of us, um, we are leaders in our own um, ethnic or um, gender communities. Um, mm. Could you give a, 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 an example of what you mean by that? Yeah, um, I've tried to be a little bit provocative and to exaggerate the point in writing it how I did. But it's really about thinking about what individual contribution you may have made in your own community. So where you're talking about leadership, if you consider yourself a leader in your community, spell it out in the cover letter of exactly what is, how is it you've been a leader? What is your experience? What are the skills and knowledge you've built up by having prominence in your community? Rather than just leaving it as, um, you know, I'm a member of this group or um, I've assisted and been part of. It, it's really, can be a bit uncomfortable, but it's about thinking about what you have achieved individually and capturing that in the application. Right. Thank you. I will thank you very much for that, Craig. Just quickly looking around to make sure that there's no more questions. Um, because now I'll come to um, the final um, uh, state sector um, speaker um, for today, and then we'll move on to Prabha and Jerry to talk about their experiences. Um, Ayana from um, the Ministry of um, Business Innovation and Employment. That's why. Uh, kia ora everyone. Um, Marina, if I could also get you to uh, share the screen and um, do the slides for me as well. Thank you so much. Cool. So kia ora everyone. I'm yeah, grateful to be given the opportunity to speak to you today in regards to MB's role on state sector appointments. I've also got my colleagues with me, Lucilla Brandt um, and Leanne Hay in this korero to um, answer questions that you may have at the end of the presentation. Mm -hmm. I think you have your um, oh, slide. Well, I'll try yeah. and share my screen instead. You should be able to. Yeah. Cool. Is that? Um... Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay. Cool. That works. Cool. So um, just a brief overview of the talk. So I'll be doing a brief introduction on our team's role on state sector appointments and upcoming appointments between now and December 2021, the skills and experience that we may that we have on the boards and committees that we work with, our recent work that our team's been doing and encouraging an increasing diversity on our boards, and any tips for incoming directors or directors interested on being in state sector boards. And a lot of these would be a reiteration of what Murray, Craig and Hugh have already uh, spoken about. So our team, uh, MB is an appointing agency. So we are a team of eight. We've got our manager, we've got three advisors, three senior advisors and a coordinator. So our team lead a board appointments process for 35 entities. 
So the type of entities that we work with, so we've got the crown company, so that's your crown research institutes as an example. So the likes of Ag Research, Manaki Whenua, GNS, um, we've got crown entities. An example of that is WorkNet, WorkSafe New Zealand board. We've got disputes resolution boards. Uh, an example is the copyright tribunal. We've got occupational regulatory boards, which um, an example of that is the engineering associates registration board and statutory board. So an example is the New Zealand standards approval board. And on top of that, our team also support a number of policy teams within MB in providing advice on board appointments. So we assist a total of eight ministers with board appointments and responsible for appointments in eight different portfolios. So you've got the economic development, energy and resources, research science and, and, and innovation, building and construction, commerce and consumer affairs, tourism, workplace relations and safety, and regional economic development. So the next slide, I wanna talk about upcoming appointments between now and December, 2021. So a total of 112 appointments um, 27 are current or on, on, on hold. So we've got 20, uh, 27 current vacancies or recruitment are already in progress. Um, and we're just waiting on post election to resume. 55 are due in the first six months of 2021. 30 between July and December. Um, and this includes 18 chair roles. And some of these may be reappointments where the responsible minister would reappoint existing members. In other case, a lot. Um, so our approach uh, with the board appointments process, most of our roles are publicly advertised. Some are targeted search. So this is where we need a candidate or candidates with a specific set of skills. But mostly when publicly advertised, we would use MB board vacancies page, seekjobs.govt.nz, um, some cases we may also advertise on the Institute of Directors uh, website um, and in other cases as well, legis legislative requirements. Um, some would be advertised on local newspapers per, as per legislation, um, law society website and other avenues, depending on the set of skills at that particular time at any given um, uh, appointment round. We also seek nominations from nominating agencies like TPK, um, uh, Kelsey's talked about it, Ministry for Women, Office of Disability Issues, Ministry for Pacific Peoples, um, and Office of Ethnic Communities. Uh, we also seek nominations from the government's caucus colleagues and support parties. Uh, we would notify Treasury database candidates. Um, and at the moment, we try and capture all the nominations and all the applications through the MB recruitment tool that, they, that we use to recruit staff. So that is called Springboard. And just the recent work with our marketing team at MB, um, we've got a marketing plan, whereas we would promote the advertisement via social media, so via LinkedIn, um, we would display advertisement via Google ads. So we would target members in our community based on the job title, sector, and employment skill set. So ads would display our board vacancies page, depending on the relevant Google search terms or on the appointment round at that time. So kind of like when you're online shopping, if you're shopping for gardening tools, all of a sudden everything is about gardening. So that's the kind of idea that we're trying to work with with our, our marketing team at MB. Cool, so um, just to touch upon the skills and experience that um, our boards or committees that we work with, uh, for each role, we would normally work with board chairs to assess the skills and experience to complement the existing membership. And sometimes we would also meet with the chief executives and do site visits just to further understand the organization and the work of the organization that would assist us in running or facilitating the board appointments process. Um, and different skill set would suit boards. So for crown companies or like, for example, for your crown research, research institutes, you would want people with um, extensive governance experience, technical or um, experience in the scientific research and understanding of the science system. So the funding system and how every funding would inject and would influence the organization or the Crown Research Institute as a whole. So for Crown entity like the external reporting board, um, 
an understanding of the accounting standards and applying the accounting standards um, would be really helpful on that board. For the speech resolutions board, like the disciplinary committee, experience in facilitating disciplinary hearings, your legal background, um, technical skills, um, and whatever, uh, let's say for the disciplinary committee, it's a financial, it's under the Financials Act. So if you're a layman member, if you're a lay member, then we would want you to have technical skills in financial management. Um, and for occupational regulatory boards, like the Chartered Professionals Engineering Council, engineering or knowledge of the engineering industry would also be helpful. And for some cases, uh, the legislation re would require you to have a specific set of skills as well. So as the skills and experience at given time would be captured in the attached position description or person specification if we publicly advertise the role as well as targeted search. So we would always have position description attached to both those types of recruitment process. Cool, so just a, a few of the recent work um, that we've been doing and encouraging diversity on boards. We've been proactively engaging with nominating agencies and talking to them about upcoming appointments. Uh, before lockdown, we also met with Institute of Directors um, and had initial discussions with them about increasing the number of future directors on our boards. We've also been looking at the governance aspect of our team's role. So we've been trying to understand the cultures of the board, what is good governance and diversity of thought or diversity and the value it really adds on the board. And we were wanting to start engaging, proactively engaging with the chairs on that governance aspect of the role that we have. Um, we've also been proactively engaging with ministers' offices and we will continue this with incoming ministers post-election. We've also got participation in the innovation and lab work group or, and state sector governance working groups um, and the building a value proposition for diversity on boards and addressing the lack of data on diversity on state sector boards. Cool. So I just want to spend a bit of time now um, to talk about tips for incoming directors or if you're interested on being on a state sector board. So the first thing is a genuine interest in the work of the organization you want to apply to. Um, you want, we want you to proactively engage with the nominating agencies that you want that you've signed up to or wanting to sign up to and work with them on tailoring your cover letter and CV to match the skills and experience to the position description and pay specific attention to the person's specification because it may change for every appointment round. And um, do your homework, understand the role of the board and the environment or the sector that the board or the entity operates in. Uh, for new directors, get onto voluntary boards, board of trustees in schools, do community work and just build visibility across the public, uh, public sector. Um, and because of the nature of our boards, um, have a national level system view. What I mean by that is that we don't discriminate against having a rural perspective because we encourage to have a geographical spread across the board. But what I mean is that the candidates should be thinking about the organization that they are applying to or the board that they are applying to and its benefit on a national level. And in some boards, in some cases, be able to even provide an international level perspective. So I'm talking about like, for example, boards like the Joint Accreditation System of Australia and New Zealand, where they, the purpose of that organization is to enhance um, trade between the Trans-Tasman trade and international trade. So we want you to bring in the international level perspective as well. Uh, build your governance experience, take any opportunities you have to build that experience. And um, yeah, I'd also encourage you to sign up to future directors program. Cool, so that's the end of the presentation and I'm grateful to have this opportunity again and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, I had received um, a, a question. Um, mm -hmm. uh, um, sorry. Um, is, it, um, is it enough to um, have um, NGO community and iwi experience in governance um, and meet some of the skills 
um, to put your name forward for um, some of the boards that you um, you have? Um, to be honest, uh, the answer of that is yes. So it's a case by case basis. So if the role of, or the board that we are working with at that time um, would want that experience, then definitely put your name forward. Um, and yeah, pay attention to the advert and the position description person specification because it may change from time to time. So yeah, it really depends on, um, yeah, just doing a bit of homework and knowing what the organization does. Um, and for example, if you've got EWE experience, then have a look at an organization when there's a huge policy um, about rural or if they affiliate a lot with um, like the rural um, areas. So I'm thinking about forestry industries and stuff like that, then that um, experience would actually be helpful as well. Great. Thank yeah, you can I say that the, Craig's advice there on, on putting your cover letter in your CV, you know, aligns with that, as, as Ayana has said, if you, your experience can come from these really different places, but, mm -hmm. you know, m try and make the best case you can to show how it's going to really add value to, you know, any given board. You know, even the commercial boards, while you could say they're kind of biased towards other you know, people with other company director experience, that's not always going to be the case. So, you know, it, as exactly as Ayana has said, it, what's happening for that organization, you know, that could provide an opening for you yeah. that, where your experience fits. Yeah. yeah, and just to provide you a realistic example as well, we've actually appointed a person on a, a Crown Entity Board with NGO experience because we needed that specific experience to be able to know um, how accounting standards would apply to NGOs and small, uh, medium, small to medium enterprises. So it was really valuable and that person um, added value. So we always look at that and just reiterating what Craig and Murray said is, yeah, how would you add value to the board and to the organization? It's a good thing to think about before applying. Yeah, the other general thing. Sorry, uh, Craig, after you. <laughs> alongside this too, I think it actually highlights an issue of confidence in some situations because we know in terms of HR, for example, that many female candidates won't um, refer to some skills and experience because they feel they have, don't quite reach the mark. So it's about not discounting that experience that might not be exactly what's been looked for but which there are relevant aspects to that, that should be cited in the application. The other thing to say uh, about that, Marina, is that there's two points to make. One is that um, whether you're coming from the private market sector or the social economy, even in those sectors, you have to build up experience. Just because you're the director of um, a two-person plumbing company doesn't give you automatic skills to be uh, the director on the government superannuation uh, board. <laughs> so that, that's the first thing to say. And the second thing to say is that many of the CVs that do come in for, for boards um, include people who are not only uh, directors of public companies with significant corporate experience, but they all in their own right have significant NGO and charitable organization governance experience as well, which they've built alongside so it's not an either or well thank you very much um ayana um but then also to the other um senior public servants who had contributed um this afternoon in the session we'll now end the session um with um uh, prabha um, ravi and uh jerry he who will talk about their um uh, emerging diverse leaders experience uh, with state sector boards Thanks very much, Prava and Jerry. Kira, everyone, thank you so much for the opportunity, Marina. This is really great even to listen to some of our speakers here who have presented valuable information for aspiring uh, board, board roles in state sector. So here, Jerry and I are actually here to talk about the other side of the, the story as consumers of people who have been aspiring to get onto the boards and the challenges we have faced during this process. 
So I will just start with introducing myself very briefly. I am an ethnic Indian, migrated with my family 21 years ago uh, to New Zealand with my two children, fam husband and two children who were three and four then. Both of them are now um, fully grown up in New Zealand and identified themselves as Kiwi Indians. Whereas my husband and I being first generation migrants, we still identify ourselves as Indian Kiwis. So we've still got that Indianism a little bit more than our children. So I'm just putting this in the context because the diversity that we are talking about, the diversity and inclusion we're talking about in the state sector boards is about that diverse thinking and the diverse experience, the skills, the place that we were born and brought up that we bring along with ourselves and also the connections that we have made uh, along the way, you know, in, in New Zealand with other multicultural community groups is also valuable in this in this space. That's why I'm talking about the Indian Kiwi and Kiwi Indian. And just about my um, governance role, I started my governance role 15 years ago, um, starting off my role as a board member at Education Wellington International. My background has mainly been in the education sector in New Zealand. However, I've also, I also run my own um, Indian classical dance school for 21 years. So I've got my art and culture and, and community work that I do through my dance school and through other, uh, other work that I do, which I'll talk to you in a minute. So it's been, it's been an experience where the governance roles have really grown in me. When I first started my governance role in 2005, it was more like, okay, here I am, I'm, I'm here to learn. And it's a very new experience. But over time, in the last 15 years, most of my governance, almost all my governance roles have been in the NGO sector, in the community sector, and in varying, various capacities where we have been, where I've been as an advisory board member, I've been an executive committee member, sat on subcommittees, been a deputy chair and also currently now I'm chairing in the last five years I've been chairing some boards as well. And also the experience that I've gained in the governance sector has been in, in diverse sector groups. For example, I've, 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 I sit on a health board, I sit on a sports board, I sit on regional council board, education board. So there's been quite a mixed variety of experiences that we have, that I have gained along away. Some, sometime about five or six years ago, with the encouragement from some of the community leaders in, in, the, uh, in the Wellington region, they suggested that Prabha, you do so much for the community and you've been involved in the community. How about um, putting your name forward for some state sector boards? This was six years, five to six years ago. Um, they suggested that I think it would be really valuable because you do not hesitate to speak up and you also bring a diverse perspective. Why don't you put your name? So with that encouragement and some sort of support and recommendation, I thought, okay, let me let me give it a go and started applying for some of the state sector uh, board roles, obviously in the areas that I have expertise in, in the areas that I'm really keen to contribute, for example, in the art and the culture and education and community boards and those sort of areas where I thought I have something to contribute and I can and give it a go. But in the process, I realized that, of course, I didn't, I wasn't very successful in the, in the, in the rounds. And um, slowly I started to get uh, understanding, get some understanding that there is a requirement of having a governance CV. So this is all learning along the process, you know, while, while you are in the process of trying to get into boards. The governance CV, mm, okay, I didn't think about that. So started to explore what are the opportunities there. But apart from that also, I had um, attended a lot of training during the last 15 years, equipping myself with enough knowledge and, uh, and, and skills to do a governance board role effectively and not just be a tick box in the, in the process because that's something that just because I'm a diverse ethnic woman doesn't mean that I'm, I'm appointed there just for them to tick a box, but actually want to be a valuable contributor. So, and to be a valuable contributor, I need to equip myself with some training. So there's so many resources out there. 
And what I realized was also since a lot of those um, training, it's not cheap. It's quite expensive. You do have to really spend some money um, to invest. But there are a lot of other free resources that are also available. But I thought, okay, I'm going to do a mix of both. Go and seek some real experience, get some training, and also invest in my governance journey. And, and started to, um, I attended the financial essentials um, course with Institute of Directors, plus a lot of governance 101 and a lot of other governance um, training uh, sessions as well through NZSTA, through my other board roles that I uh, gained the knowledge and experience. So having gained all of these skills and having been applying for a lot of state sector boards, it's still been a challenge to get into a state sector board. And that's what I'm here to speak about as to what is it, what else do we need to do? And now that I've heard the speakers speak about what else we could do, I was just thinking, okay, a lot of my cover letters did talk about a diverse perspective did talk about my community engagement, more, not in the depth of what the appointment agency officers are looking for. So that's, that's a really good tip that I've gained from today's uh, session, which is fantastic. That, okay, I need to elaborate more on what kind of subcommittees I've sat on, or what kind of um, diverse perspective I brought to the board table, and how has it enhanced the board's performance? And how has it really reached out? And it's it's really that that's the kind of insight, that's the kind of you know mm. knowledge that we need. Apart from being visible, I think Betty is going to talk about the personal band branding and 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 about the uh, connections you have to make. I'm not going to cover that off. But thank you very much, um, Prava. I'm just conscious of time, and I just wanted to um, give um, Jerry an opportunity to speak about his board experience. Thank you. Absolutely. So, Jerry, you can go ahead and um, cover the, the second part of our presentation. Nga, nga mihi nui. Kia koto katoa. Um, first and foremost, I would like to thank the Civil Diversity Institute for this opportunity to share our journeys with you. So, uh, very similar to women equality, people with diverse backgrounds and views are now joining forces in the governance space. So, we, let's work together and lead Aotearoa out of this unprecedented time. But according to the recent study from um, the Super Diversity Institute, um, when we reach the year of 2030, one of three keys in Aotearoa is going to be Asian descent. So if you look at the New Zealand employment market as a pyramid, we have one of the most diverse workforce uh, in a middle management, about two thirds of the pyramids. But if you look at the top 33%, the managers, the executives, especially the governance space are underrepresented by leaders with diverse backgrounds and views. So in my opinion, it's a good ratio of representation at the decision table can help us to enable the future policies, the strategies that can be very practical and inclusive that is going to be fit for purpose for the new New Zealand. So I'm gonna share with you, um, you know, my personal journey. I believe having this understanding is crucial. You know, as aspiring leaders, um, we need to have a very proper governance vision, a roadmap, and also accordingly the action plans to enable us to get to where we want to be. And how I started my governance journey, so um, it actually started when um, I, I made a, an intentional self-recommendation. So uh, when I was run, running my own FMCG manufacturing in, in uh, 2015, um, someone from my Singaporean network contacted me and applied advice to a trade facilitation based in Singapore. And the trade facilitation actually connects SMEs Trade supports researchers, large corporations, government agencies, um, you know, throughout the ASEAN network. So during that process, I discovered that they are in a process of forming the constitution and uh, forming a board. And I proposed to the chair and see if I could actually assist in this process. Then I presented to him, and uh, from a, a member's point of view, you know, how do I actually use the services? How do I participate in the network? And how do I gain benefits as a member? And of course, I presented them with my concerns, um, the issues, and of course, the solutions towards the issues that you know will be solve those issues. Um, the committee got me to present to the board, and long story short, I became the founding chair of Asia Pacific Energy Coalition. We were servicing more than three thousand trade businesses across New Zealand. 
back home here, uh, my public governance actually started uh, in a networking event. Um, during the conversation that I had with the contact who works for the in ministry, um, I discovered they're looking for a business person who connects SMEs and also agencies. Um, work as a conduit. So I put my hand up um, and say whether I could actually present my views to the board um, and also to the minister as well. So then I did. I was so blessed to serve the Small Business Development Network and also the Small Business Council for the last three and a half years. But of course, the journey is not always rosy. So I've received numerous of rejections, and there were times that I got to the last interview that didn't end up with um, getting the, the, the position at all. So I would like to go through a little bit of my five key points as recommendations and conscious of time. But first is networking. Please make sure the person that you are self-recommending can introduce you to the key people in the hiring committee. Um, I, I cannot stress uh, how much that IOD has done for me because IOD has been very good for me. Um, and not just the uh, courses, but also um, giving you the chance to meet with other directors. Um, number two, building your personal brand. Apparently that we have diverse advantage. Me personally, I built my brands around cross-cultural benefits, digital leadership, agile, continuous improvement, and, and international connections, right? That, um, you know, you have to pr keep promoting these attributes to the search agent. Uh, the like of Schiffel, Jackson Stone in Wellington, central local government databases, it's important to know this is a push strategy. It's not a push strategy, so you have to work hard to get noticed. Number three, strategic pick out boards, targets, and ministries that, you know, where you can actually see some special contribution that you can make. Contact the board and the executives. Make a case for yourself. Um, you know, uh, according to a, a friend of mine who is chair of many boards, he gets these applications in front of him, and they are not ignored. Number four, Ask leaders in business you can work with and have a genuine connection with them and make sure they can vouch for you. Ask them to back you up and then, you know, when you apply for an um, application, that will, that will be great. One of the very special things that I've done, um, I never regret, is to build myself a board of mentors. So they could use, I could use them as a sounding board and then use them as a foundation. Last but not least, you know, I trust the power of helping each other. So I think here, um, as New Zealand nation leaders and civil that are visiting this, um, institutions, we need to help each other out. Um, without further ado, I would like to pass the ball back to Prava. You know, what's your recommendation to the team? Prava? My, my recommendation would be to work, out, work at it continuously, don't give up and keep um, matching your skills, developing yourself really equipping yourself with all the knowledge and um, uh, experience that you need to perform the role very effectively. But apart from that, I would say the connections are extremely, extremely mm. important. I can't uh, emphasize enough on how important the connections are and being visible and creating a brand for yourself. It is, um, it is the tool that will get you the first put on the door. Once you are there and you've proved yourself and you've worked hard, I think it opens many more doors. Definitely the first opportunity is quite hard. It's not easy. And um, we do need to keep, keep at it. And I'm doing that. I haven't got my first experience yet at the state sector board, but I haven't given up even after six to seven years. And I am, uh, I will be trying and I think all the advice that's been given right now has been very useful. So thank you so much um, thank you. for the opportunity. Yes, no, well, thank you to Papa and um, to Jerry as well. Well, hopefully we will see you on more Treasury um, uh, Ministry of Ethnic Communities, um, uh, Ministry for Women um, and Ministry of Innovation, uh, Business and Employment boards um, now that you have both um, introduced yourselves um, and what you can do. Um, so I want to thank um, the um, uh, public service um, uh, officials uh, for their contributions today. Thank you very much for your time um, and for um, sharing your um, skills and knowledge with us. Um, Murray, uh, Craig, Kelsey, uh, Joanne, um, uh, and also Hugh and um, Ayana. 
Um, and thank you to um, Prabha and Jerry for sharing their stories as merging um, diverse leaders with us. And thanks to everybody else. Um, I will be sending around uh, copies of all of the presentations, um, a copy of the, uh, this recording, and um, also um, some further resources um, for, uh, for you on this um, governance training session. Um, thanks very much for taking the time to join us today. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marina. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Marina. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Marina. Thank you. Thank you.